Morning everybody. Welcome back to IndyCar on Monday morning. Uh, today I'm actually in Mary Hill and the show today is actually about the presentation or well, presentation perhaps but the way in which the uh, the Commonwealth Games have been presented to us by particularly the BBC recently. Yesterday you couldn't have, uh, have moved for seeing endless reruns of pictures of the English netball team winning a, a late victory against the favourites Australia in, uh, in the netball. It was, to be fair, a, a fantastic victory for England and against all the odds and against uh, everybody's expectations. So it was a wonderful victory for the underdogs. But the way it was being presented by the press, you would have thought that nothing else had happened with any other uh, so-called home nations team during the Commonwealth Games. But the truth of the matter was very different. It was hinted at this morning on uh, the breakfast programme that in fact the English Commonwealth Games team for this particular Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast performed worse than anybody else for 30 years. They had a real medal slump, had a great deal of difficulty winning anything and for some reason many of the, the favourites to win medals from the English squad just failed to perform. Now on top of that there is also the absence of any mention of the huge success that Scotland and Wales have had. Now Wales did get a mention this morning I have to say to be fair to the BBC. Wales got a big mention this morning that they had done extremely well but the BBC omitted to really tell us how well Scotland did during this Commonwealth Games. Now, in an away Commonwealth Games, when it's not your home nation hosting it, you're at a disadvantage and so you tend to, to win fewer medals. But this Commonwealth Games, Scotland has done better than ever. In fact, it has won more medals per head of population than any other country in the Commonwealth Games, as far as I understand from the statistics. Wales, likewise, has done extremely well, punching well above its weight. Northern Ireland has won medals, gold medals, I believe, this year um, in the Commonwealth Games for boxing, among other things. And interestingly, for the first time ever, the Isle of Man itself has won a Commonwealth Games medal. It's something which you never, ever hear about, the Isle of Man winning anything. All of these things are interesting just from the point of view of the fact that the home nations, in other words, Scotland, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland, and the Isle of Man as well, if you look at the Isle of Man as a separate issue, get almost zero mention in the sports coverage. It's all about how England is doing or not doing and playing up every performance that they, they win at or every medal that they win, and very little has been made of the Scottish so far. Yesterday, the, the big thing that the BBC played upon yesterday was that the Scottish athlete who was in the process of winning the marathon finally collapsed with less than, uh, I think it was less than a mile to go to his, uh, to his finish line. Collapsed from the heat, it was 30 degrees Celsius, he's not used to running in the heat and he, he collapsed from heat prostration and is recovering in hospital. That was all over the BBC. Nothing to show that the the guy who actually came in after that was another Scot. They mentioned it briefly, but nothing much was made of it. Big play over the Scotsman who collapsed. Nothing much about the Scotsman who who came back. And, you know, who did so well in the in the uh, in the marathon. So again, it's the usual presentation of Br Britishness as being. England's performance and Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, the Isle of Man gaining little bits and pieces of, uh, of information as though we're some kind of second class citizens who don't really matter. So that's my usual beef about sports coverage from the BBC done for the day. Uh, I'd like to move on now to the issue of uh, Syria which is still rumbling on and on and we find out today that there's going to be a debate. A debate on whether or not they should have bombed a place that they've already bombed. I mean, it's pathetic, it's absolutely ridiculous to have a debate after you have fired hundreds of cruise missiles at three sites in, the, in somebody else's country. My question is, why was there such a rush for Britain to fire these missiles off when if they'd waited one more day, the uh, United Nations weapons inspectors would have gone into the site that they destroyed to see if there were chemical weapons there. But instead of waiting to see that there was evidence of chemical weapons, they just obliterated the place, whether it was uh, to do with chemical weapons or not, they suspected it was. 
But the Syrian government claims that the site that was one of the sites that was destroyed, two of them were air bases, so obvious military targets. The third one was a civilian pharmaceutical test facility, a laboratory which was used to develop vaccines and to test uh, drugs for use in, in the population generally. So it's a bit like our, our NICE, our, uh, our, what do they call it, the National Institute for, for, for Clinical Excellence. They, they have something similar in Syria where they have a, a, a drug testing laboratory which certifies drugs for use. That's what was destroyed by the cruise missiles, not the chemical weapons base. Not only was it just destroyed, it was wiped off the, the surface of the planet. It was hit by 56 missiles. 56 missiles to destroy one building. Why were they so desperate to obliterate it and turn it to dust? What was it about this building that they didn't want us to know? I suspect that the fact that they obliterated it completely was really just to destroy any evidence of the fact that there weren't any chemical weapons there. Because if there had been, there would be traces. Now, if, if they do send a, an inspection team to that site now, after it has been blown up and burning for days, there'll be very little left to find, even if there were chemical weapons there. Not to mention the fact that all the tweets and the threats and the posturing that have been going on for the last few days before the attack will easily have telegraphed the fact to the Syrians and the Russians on the ground that they're going to be attacked. One engineer who worked at the, the chemical uh, test facility, the pharmaceutical test facility that was destroyed, has told uh, the media that they didn't think that they would be targeted because they're a civilian centre. And they believed that their, their plant would be safe. They believed that their laboratories would be safe because they were a medical research facility and therefore they couldn't be targeted under the UN, any UN mandate or in fact any mandate at all. And this is why I believe there was this rush to, to bomb it before the UN could say, oh, but wait a second, this is a medical facility, we shouldn't bomb it. Now it's been bombed, it's a fait accompli, there's nothing that can be done about it. The West could just say, well, oops, sorry, we didn't mean to hit that, it's a mistake. Plus the fact that it's not mentioned in the, the press this morning is that one of the cruise missiles uh, hit a residential area of Damascus well off target, didn't hit anything to do with uh, weapons grade uh, chemical weapons or, or any other military infrastructure. It just fell straight into a neighbourhood of flats and apartments, apparently killing four people and injuring dozens more. So, so much for the pinpoint accuracy of modern weapons. There will always be some that go off course, or maybe some that are hit by anti-aircraft uh, anti missiles shot down and crash unfortunately into inhabited areas. So it's the usual mess uh, that's been made by the British government of something which shouldn't have happened in the first place. They should have let the weapons inspectors find out where there were chemical weapons, where there was evidence of them being used, but instead of that there is a rush to destroy something which was apparently a completely innocent civilian centre for testing drugs. And actually it was also there for testing the safety of children's toys and equipment for, for children and babies. Who knows what the truth is here, but it seemed to me from looking at the pictures and reading articles from other uh, media around the world that what was actually hit was nothing to do with weapons grade uh, nerve agents or toxic gases at all. And there was a story circulating yesterday, whether it's true or not I can't tell you, but the story was that the British particularly wanted to destroy one particular site because it may have contained um, containers of chemicals which were sold to Syria by British companies. And these would have been the precursor chemicals which, when mixed together, could produce sarin gas. Now, sarin gas is far, far worse than chlorine or even mustard gas. Sarin is fatal. It, it's, it's a horrible nerve agent. And yet it appears that some British companies may have been selling the precursor chemicals to Syria uh, in the years when there was an embargo. And it may have been the motivation for the British government trying to destroy certain sites in Syria to cover up the fact that British companies had been selling the actual chemicals which met, went into the manufacture of some of these uh, deadly weapons. So we'll never know the truth. As somebody once said, the first casualty of war is the truth. We don't know what, what happened or who did what. 
but we are we are told by the newspapers that because there's been a newspaper article or a television program about some event somewhere in the world that we must wade in there and bomb the hell out of them. All just based on a newspaper article. Nothing to do with intelligence, nothing to do with sending over satellites to, to have a look at the situation, putting people in on the ground, infiltrating the enemy positions and finding out where these things are. None of that seems to have been done. Um, and yet the Russians themselves predicted four weeks ago that there would be a false flag gas attack mounted by the uh, the rebel army in order to um, to frame, if you like, the Assad regime for a chemical attack as a precursor to an attack by the West. The Russians knew about it four weeks ago. They predicted it was going to happen. They had intelligence it was going to happen. And again, the West had telegraphed its intention to attack and also telegraphed its plans to stage a gas attack as a pretext for going in with the bombers. Nothing about any of these stories rings true at all. I don't believe anything that I hear in the media at the moment. The Russian side are just as skilled at propaganda, incidentally, and so when reading any reports from RT or other sources like Al Jazeera and RT, remember that there is propaganda from both sides. Uh, some of what RT says is obviously true, has an element of truth to it, but take everything with a little bit of a pinch of salt because the media world that's going on at the moment is a war of information. It's whose story is the most believable and I tend at the moment to have a look at some elements of what RT is saying that have more consistency with the known facts rather than the jingoistic let's go and bomb the hell out of them because they're gassing poor children which is the attitude of the British news industry and the British media and that seems to be what drives our foreign policy. It's not it's not the will of the people to attack this country, it's the will of the British state and its media to attack this country for their own ends. Can you think of any way that Syria is a threat to Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland or England? I can't think of a single aspect in which Syria has any, poses any threat to the United Kingdom whatsoever. But we do know that there are huge oil deposits off the Syrian coast in the Levant Basin and the Eastern Mediterranean. Inside the territorial waters of Syria are vast uh, reservoirs of oil and gas. There are oil and gas fields already in Syria and there are British and American companies wanting to get into Syria to exploit those and also to run pipelines through Syria which would have been impossible uh, before the war because Assad probably would have charged them a large sum of money to run pipelines through his territory. Add to that we have the Russians in there who have an agreement with Syria to exploit some of the oil resources of Syria to drill for oil there uh, and to, they have a license agreement with Syria. Part of their agreement with Syria as an ally was they would protect Syria from attack on the basis that they would get a share of Syria's oil wealth. There was a quid pro quo between Russia and Syria. In the meantime nobody's talking about Iran which is the, the main country in that region which the West is most worried about. Iran is surrounded on all sides by American military bases and just like Russia, which is also surrounded by American military bases, the Americans tend to encircle any country that they feel worried about. Uh, and because Syria is next door to Iran, it's seen as a place where Americans want to have a presence there in Syria. And it's likely that they will try uh, at some point in the future to make some kind of uh, impact there. But they're not managing it. The Russians have kept them out. So it's all part of a global strategic game about oil, money and the power blocks of the East and West both trying to get their hands on the oil in the Middle East and to control the flow of it through these countries into Europe and beyond. And really it has nothing to do with the Syrian war, it has nothing to do with gas attacks, it has nothing to do with uh, right and wrong, it's everything to do with geopolitics, money and oil and I think we need to all of us when viewing these things on a television need to look at it through that lens. Remember that what you're looking at is what uh, has been chosen for you to look at by the British state media. When you look at the Russian state media, it's what they have chosen to present to you. Everybody presents the story they want you to believe. You have to decide which one of these stories is believable, if any, and which or 
which ones or which groups of stories you choose to think there might be some kernel of truth in. But it's very difficult to tell now because there is a sea of information out there and trying to make any kind of sense of it is very difficult. In order to make any kind of informed choice as a civilian about what to believe, you probably have to go to about six or seven different news sources to try and find out if there's any truth in any of the news stories that you're seeing on your television screens or in your newspapers. I prefer to go online myself so that I can look at a variety of, uh, of news outlets. So I would look at Al Jazeera, I would look at RT, uh, I would look at European TV news, uh, I would look at obviously British TV news, I'd look at Irish TV news as well. And having a, a rounded look at all of these will give you a more rounded view of what's actually going on in the world instead of just listening to the British state media which is heavily controlled and heavily dependent upon uh, its, its, um, its funders. Its funders are the people who run the country, the people who run the establishment of the United Kingdom and so everything comes from them. It's their opinions that they want us to believe. They want us uh, to, to choose between what they show us. We don't get any other choices. They'll present this as good story, bad story. You must believe that it's good because this is what we're showing you is the truth. And because it's the BBC, it must be true. Not anymore. The BBC is no longer uh, viewed and can't be viewed anymore as being a truthful organisation in every sense. It does good, it does good some good work, the BBC, but we have to remember when it comes to world geopolitics, it is... Uh, it is the propaganda arm of the British state, just like RT is the propaganda arm of the Russian state. And so we just need to be careful when we're reading these situations. I think looking at it today, the whole thing seems ridiculous. They're shutting the door after the horse was bolted. They've gone and bombed a civilian pharmaceuticals test facility for no apparent reason that I can see unless there was something sinister in there which would have implicated the UK or America in these gas attacks. I can't think of any other reason why they would blow up um, a civilian uh, pharmaceuticals test facility. I mean, it's a gesture. It's a gesture that says we can't find anything to, else to shoot at, so we're just going to blow up a factory and claim that it was a chemical weapons plant. Can I understand them hitting the military bases or the airfields? Those would be military targets, but this no, I don't think so. I don't think that anybody believes that. Anyway, I'm off. Got to do some work. I'll see you later on. But uh, as usual, pay attention to the details and don't just watch one uh, television news network. Watch about six or seven of them and get a good picture of what's really happening in the world. I'll come back to you tomorrow with some more uh, Scottish-centred news. But remember... Scotland did better per head of population in this Commonwealth Games than almost any other country. I'll see you later. Bye for now.